Good morning, or almost good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, for our last keynote speech and roundtable discussion um, of the fourth annual Law Development Research Network conference. My name is uh, Michael Regner. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Humboldt University with Philip Dunn, and I have the honor to moderate this keynote speech and um, the panel discussion and the subsequent sessions of questions. Um, I will briefly introduce uh, our keynote speaker and our discussants, and um, starting obviously with David Trubeck, who, um, whom you all know, uh, who has already been introduced, and uh, I take the liberty thus to highlight maybe two feats that uh, are not as frequently highlighted maybe as, as usual, and um, we've celebrated 40 years of scholars of in self-estrangement, but there's another quasi-anniversary, which is the 50 years since David Trubeck co-launched the Yale program in law and modernization, which was the first major organized effort in the US to create a field of law and development. So this program has sponsored and spawned numerous scholars and scholarly interventions, including Bruno Dubride here in Germany, Mark Gallanter, Yash Kai, Boventura de Sousa Santos, Duncan Kennedy, and many others. So, so that is also a foundational thing. And that is the environment that led to scholars in self-estrangement. So talking about context and, and funding, um, that's maybe an, an interesting thing to note. Secondly, I just wanted to highlight his most recent uh, edited volume that just came out in 2019, which is co-edited with Sonia Roland on emerging powers in the international economic order, which treats a geopolitical shift, uh, which we also see to some extent at this conference. Uh, many scholars from Brazil, South Africa, India, notably next to none from Russia and mainland China, which is also something that uh, we can talk about when we talk about emerging powers. Um, so much for David Trubeck, and uh, I'll turn to our um, four discussants that uh, made it to Berlin, and uh, starting in, in, in order of appearance with Celine Tan, who is a reader-in-law at Warwick University and also the director of the Center for Law Regulation and Governance of the Global Economy. Earlier, she was a lecturer in law at the University of Birmingham and completed her PhD on poverty reduction strategies at the University of Warwick, which was published with Routledge in 2011. Her current research interests are in international economic law and law and development. Second um, to her um, left from your side is Maura Goodwin. Um, she holds a chair of global law and development at Tilburg Law School since 2015 received her PhD from the European, European University Institute, um, focusing on Roma nationhood, holds an LLM in international law from the University of Nottingham, and a master's in history from the University of Edinburgh. Um, she recently completed a three-year research project on social inclusion in Rwanda, and is working on a book project on that project. Um, moving on to uh, Johanna Cortes Nieto, who is an assistant professor of public law at the Uni Universidad del Rosario in Bogota. She worked at the Constitutional Court of Colombia, holds an LLM from Columbia University, and has just completed her PhD at Warwick University. Congratulations to that as well. Um, her research focuses on ESC rights, law and poverty, and inequality. And Last but not least, uh, Deval Desai is a postdoctoral research fellow and visiting lecturer at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. He holds an SJD from Harvard University, and his recent publications focus on development indicators, justice reform projects, and corporate accountability. And he has some practical experience consulting for the World Bank and doing field work in Sierra Leone, Uganda, and um, other contexts. So I think we have a very distinguished speaker and an equally distinguished uh, group of discussants, and I'm very much looking forward um, to the keynote speech. David will speak for about 20 minutes, then we'll have uh, the rounds of uh, comments for about five minutes each, and then we'll open up to the audience. So please think about your questions and hold them um, until we can open up. Thank you very much, please. Thank you, Michael. Now you know who's here. Hi. Um, so um, first I want to thank the network, and particularly Humboldt and Phil Dan, 
for inviting me to come. Um, this is kind of a repeat performance because when the first meeting of the network was held in Antwerp, I was invited to give a talk, uh, but unfortunately I came down with uh, a, a, an infection. My doctor wouldn't let me fly. Uh, and so I did it by Skype, which was actually reasonably successful and something to keep in mind as we plan ahead because it, it was, you know, not 100% of an experience to be there, but from the point of view of the audience, uh, it, it, at least they got the, the gist of the, of the presentation. Um, but I didn't have a chance to dialogue with uh, members of the of, of the uh, uh, network. And of course, that was also early days for the network. So I'm delighted to be here and have a chance to dialogue with all these wonderful people and all of you out there uh, uh, as well. So um, uh, I just want to say that I think this is a great conference. And it makes me feel very good to see how the network is evolving. Uh, taking on a lot of complicated and, and challenging uh, uh, things in this uh, strange world of law and development. Uh, and, and I am uh, very proud to be here to help with this enterprise. When they invited me to give this talk, I said, look, I wrote this article a few years ago, uh, 40 years after Scholars and Self-Estrangement, and that was kind of a diagnosis of the conditions in the field and the challenges it faced. And uh, uh, I really uh, would like to get people's reactions to that uh, rather than just giving some magisterial uh, talk, which I'm perfectly capable of doing, just want you to know that. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but I, I would have done that, uh, been there, done that, as they say. So they, these wonderful people agreed to do that. They actually agreed to read the article. I hope they did. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the gist of the diagnosis, but also add a little bit that's not in the article on some directions moving forward, which I have actually shared with the, with the, um, uh, with the um, uh, uh, commentators. Um, uh, I'm glad that uh, Michael mentioned the program on law and modernization, which was founded in 1969, exactly 50 years ago by myself, Richard Abel, and a number of other scholars. Uh, he, uh, he mentioned a number of the people, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, Professor Brunato Brida, who was later on the Constitutional Court here, as you all know, Boa Santos, Duncan Kennedy, Yash Guy, and so on. Uh, and so this is kind of like an important milestone because this was the first major organized effort in the United States to self-consciously create a field or an area or whatever of law and development. It lasted for about seven or eight years, thanks to a massive grant from the US Agency for International Development. And once that money was gone, it stopped. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was both, the, not only was it the first, uh, as, as Michael noted, it was the seedbed for the article scholars in self-estrangement and therefore the, the beginning of the long trajectory that, that's uh, tra traced in the article uh, in the University of Toronto Law Review. Okay, so I, I, in, in the article I mentioned three challenges for this area. I don't want to call it a field that brings in all sorts of things. I'm just going to call it an area, an enterprise, uh, and so on. Uh, the enterprise of law and development, I saw three problems uh, emerging out of changes in the last, say, decade or so. And I called them contextualization, fragmentation, and hegemony contextualization, fragmentation, and hegemony. Now, based on conversations here, uh, I'm going to briefly mention a fourth channel, a challenge, which I will call communication, uh, and just mention that briefly at the end. So the contextualization challenge comes from two things. First, as development policy moves away from universal scripts and, 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 or transplants or other sort of global solutions and becomes more committed to experimentation 
development policy becomes more localized because experimentation, by definition, is going to have a very strong local component. Maybe at some point experiments can be scaled up and transferred, but in the beginning at least, uh, it's a local thing. So that puts more stress on context in our field. Um, but of course, the other one has always been there, which is the, the contextual nature of legal systems, the difficulty of, of people learning and about and working with other legal systems. We've had a whole history of comparative law and so on and so forth, but it is really challenging when you're trying to understand another legal system in real time in order to come up with some useful findings. Uh, this is a real challenge uh, if you move outside of your own, uh, of your own system, but if we're going to learn from other countries, from other, other, universe, uh, other uh, developing countries, uh, or anybody, uh, we need to over, overcome that. Fragmentation, all you have to do is look at the program for this conference to know what we mean by fragmentation. I don't know, where is that colored chart here? That, you, you know, with the, this. That's fragmentation, there it is. That is, we've got, and, and, and there are a lot of topics that aren't there. There's no climate change topic, uh, and I could think of three or four others, uh, but they ran out of colors, uh, so we couldn't have those topics. But next year, they'll have more colors, uh, I'm sure. They've, South Africa is very, very, very big on color in South Africa, you know. Look at, the, look, at, look, look, at the, look at the flag, it's very colorful. So, okay, so remember that. S climate change will make it blue. Okay, is that okay? That's okay? All right. Uh, okay, that's contextualization. Fragmentation, I don't have to explain it to you. People who are in this field somehow understand that although their specialty may be climate change or, or human rights or human rights and climate change or financial development or the role of central banks or whatever, or international economic law, uh, they have to somehow know about things beyond their stream. In other words, in other words, wait a minute, wait, get this picture again. Where is it? Okay, cross-stream activity, right? You have to be able to go from the human rights and technical challenges to the gender identity stream. But how do you do that? Because you see it all goes down this way. So there's a fragmentation problem but which you need to overcome. Not easy. Hegemony, well, I, do I have to explain that? Hegemony comes about from the, the simple fact that universities in the North, like this one, uh, are better organized, better funded. The people aren't smarter, uh, maybe not even as smart, but <laughs> I don't know. We have no way to test this. They're smart enough to get me here, so they must be pretty smart in Germany. Um, but uh, just without trying, the, 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 there's a tendency to, be, to have a greater influence simply because of history, capitalism, all that stuff. Uh, one of the things I've noted is that as law and development has sort of moved from something, you know, sort of small group of people who all sort of know everything into the world of streams, that the, the, often there are networks, like a human rights network or a financial law network or whatever, that tend to be based in the North, and it's very attractive to people from the South to become part of those networks because they offer fellowships, trips to Harvard, trips to Berlin, whatever, uh, and that tends, without anyone intending bad things, to reinforce the hegemony of the North. So that's the hegemony problem. And the communication challenge, which, which I've just added uh, uh, to the list, is simply the problem of just communicating all this stuff across all these streams in all these countries. Wait a minute, there's a map here. Well, anyway, I'm wasting time on the map here. All these countries, 
right? So that's a communication challenge, and we have to deal with that. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about meeting these challenges, um, and uh, uh, and then um, uh, and then we'll turn it over and see if anybody agrees with me or not. Okay. Uh, so. As I, as I noted in the, in the first plenary with Katerina, um, the, we're in an era of law and development in which we're really trying to figure out what works. And that's an empirical question. We have to keep an open mind. We don't, uh, we don't enter into a situation with a pre-existing script. And so we must figure out ways to learn what works. And one way that you can overcome the problem of context is, uh, and, by, uh, and learn about what works, is by developing networks of scholars who develop the capability to study similar developing countries legal experimentation and see if there are ideas that can be brought to another country. Uh, I wrote an article on this, and we call, I used a phrase from Stiglitz called scan globally, reinvent locally, scan globally, although if in, in our case, scan similarly situated developing countries and uh, uh, reinvent locally, bring back such knowledge as you think is useful and can actually work in your country. This requires an immense institutional uh, a structure, uh, and I mentioned that in the first plenary, so I don't want to go into that. So fragmentation, as, as, as I noted, fragmentation is the inevitable result of the need for specialized knowledge. You, I've, I've, as, as Michael mentioned, I just finished two books on international economic law, a field that I had not worked in until, say, five or six years ago. This is a very specialized field. I couldn't do it alone. I had partners, obviously, who, who, know, who know more than I do about the technical area. Um, uh, but you have to have that specialized knowledge in order to say something sensible about the field. On the other hand, on the other hand, you don't want to be limited in your silo of that specialized knowledge if you're trying to understand how the law works or doesn't work in a country. You need, you know, maybe maybe your international economic law people have to know about litigation in the courts or in or arbitration or whatever. And so, it, it, at some point, real world problems break down the the, the, the silos. Or you have to break down the silos in order to study real world problems. Uh, and you have to find ways to communicate all this uh, 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 to, uh, to, to each other. And, and that is a tremendous challenge. Um, we can't eliminate fragmentation, but we can encourage recognition of the interdependence of the silos or the streams. The interdependence of the silos and the streams. We need an open architecture that su supports the specialized streams while fostering dialogue among them uh, and this, car the architecture of this conference, I won't bore you by showing this again, uh, but this is one way that's being done because the, 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 the streams are identified, but anybody who wants to find out what's going on in human rights can, you know, th th there are no locks on the doors. You can go to the human rights panel, right? But maybe we can do more. Maybe we can facilitate what I might call interstream communication or inter silo, whatever. Uh, so that's, and some of these streams could evolve into more long run collaborative networks that could do scan globally or scan uh, around the developing world, reinvent locally, could develop into um, uh, projects to do uh, uh, comparative studies that could yield some uh, insight about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the network here, the LDRN, could support those streams the way the Law and Society Association supports collaborative research networks uh, and, uh, uh, and, and things like that. 
So that's, that's, that's fragmentation, that, that's uh, uh, context. So third is, is hegemony. So what do we do about hegemony? Uh, uh, well, it seems to me that you know, we, we have to uh, do what has been done in this conference, um, which is to make a special effort to reach out to scholars and institutions in the global south uh, from institutions in the north and gradually build a true partnership rather than a kind of hegemonic, we'll be nice to you guys down there, we love you, we know you have problems, but a real partnership. And I think that the uh, Law and Development Research Network is moving in that direction uh, and, and uh, I, I totally endorse. Uh, that move. There are a few places in the global south that have some strengths. The one I know best, I'm not pushing it, but is the, the nucleus in Sao Paulo, which is made up of several universities that cooperate and have held numerous uh, events. Uh, uh, and, and there are other, other nuclei like this around the world that, that we could build on. Uh, and bring in, as, as I know, the, the Law and Development Network has invited the two key Sao Paulo institutions uh, to join. Uh, so, um, so I think that uh, uh, moving in that direction, building, uh, uh, being sure that the governance system of the network, for example, uh, is uh, shared between the North and the South uh, would be uh, a, a, a good move. I think that's underway. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and of course, uh, meetings in the South, which uh, you've already started, uh, uh, is another good move. I do want to caution you about meetings in the South. I think that's a great idea, you're meeting in South Africa. I know you've talked to the Brazilians and the Indians uh, about, about this, but you have to bear in mind that the capabilities in the Southern universities are, 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 are limited. Uh, and uh, even in Sao Paulo, which has, has a lot of capability, with the cu current political economic crisis in Brazil, uh, uh, they're facing a lot of problems uh, that they didn't even have before, and this is true all over. So you have to be very careful uh, about such meetings, and also you don't want to lose your uh, Northern European, and, and hopefully we can bring in some Americans uh, 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 people by meeting, uh, you know, too too frequently uh, in the South. And if you do meet in the South, you have to help finance uh, those meetings. So those are sort of my suggestions as to how to deal with those three problems. And I'll just finish by talking about communication. Communication problem is created by all the other problems. That is by 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 uh, context. Uh, context fragmentation and hegemony, uh, it means that the communication networks tend to be uh, northern dominated, not because anyone is doing anything evil, but you've got the money and the people and the technology, so it's easier uh, to, to do things. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the communication problem is magnified by fragmentation because you've got all these different streams going off in different directions and yet you have to try to pull them together. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on. Now, the current situation in this field in communication is terrible, okay? It's terrible. Uh, uh, you have one journal, which is relatively narrow, comes out infrequently, run by one person who owns it and has maintained it for years. He's done a decent job, but it's not enough for a field with this kind of vitality. So we need something else. We need more, we need imagination, we need technology you need to reinvent technology for the 21st century for a global institution. And I think that the, the network's website is a starting point, but just that. So those are my thoughts, and I hope that people agree with me or tell me I'm completely wrong. Thank you, uh, Philip and Michael and Thomas, for uh, inviting me here to comment 
on uh, this and to be part of this conversation about the future of law and uh, development studies. And um, <clears throat> when I uh, got the brief, um, we were kind of told that it's going to be kind of like a conversation that we're having. So I'm going to have this conversation in reference to uh, David's uh, presentation today in which he mapped out um, his vision um, and what he saw as challenges for the field of law and development. And I would like us to, in I would like to invite all of us, really, to think about what I see as the gaps and the missing narratives and the missing spaces um, that inhabit the field um, today. So the first one I would say is there seems to be um, a rec a lack of recognition for the complexity of the field. So, I mean, we're all academics, so we strive very hard to um, define the field. You know, we, 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 un we, we undertake these mapping exercises, we try to categorize ourselves, we try to have a con chronological story of how the field emerged. And I think, you know, that's worthwhile doing. It's not, you know, it's not something that, that, that isn't, it's useless. Um, but I think that our desire to map and understand, and categorize and box in things um, makes us unappreciate the complexity of the field. And I think that law and development is in, in, indeed a very, very um, uh, uh, complex field. I think that um, it is very difficult to reduce it to a ideology, a perspective, an approach. I think there's a plurality, which is the theme of this conference. And I think that's something to bear in mind. I think there are many, many more stories to tell. Um, and I think we should let them be told. And so that leads me to my second point, which is that the stories that have been told um, are problematic uh, at the moment. And we mustn't forget that the development discourse in itself is a form of discipline. It is a form of regulation. It's a form of regulatory behavior. And that development policy and practice and the law and the legal systems and the legal processes that have underpinned them have had a long lineage, and it has deeply violent roots in colonialism, in resource extraction. Um, and it has been used, law development, development policy, has been used to legitimize interventions into the third world. And I use the term third world here, as some of you will know, not as a derogatory term, but as one of uh, emancipation, of empowerment, um, that reflects the shared history of the struggles of the people in the South. And so when we speak of contextualization, um, which, which, which um, David talked about earlier, and challenging this epistemic hegemony of the North and Northern institutions, it isn't just about you know, providing you know, spaces for people to come in, but actually we must, you know, it, it's about disrupting the existing narratives about the South, about people like you, um, me, um, and everybody else. We must understand that this historically, and it is a historical and contemporary feature of law and development, that, that, that this discourse in itself can be disempowering, right? And this hegemony, this epistemic hegemony, this fact that development is fundamentally rooted in the colonial practice of domination, of resource extraction, right? And, and continues to be a tool of extraction. It's not, you know, it's not an approach that I take. It's not an ideology that somebody else has. It is not, you know, a perspective of the uh, uh, within the plurality of law and development studies. It's not that. It is a historical fact. Right? <laughs> and how? Uh, so, and how we respond to this historical material fact will then define our approaches to law and development in scholarship, in practice, and in teaching. And at the broader level, it will determine how we move forward as, a scho as scholars, as researchers, as teachers, as activists, as advocates. Um, uh, for development, which I think is, is a catch-all term um, for all the inequality, the poverty, the problems that we face in the world today, the climate crisis um, that we face today. And I think that we need to look at these critical traditions of law and development um, uh, and counter this very 
tendency to box in, to instrumentalize, to technify development and development policy to understand. And that's absolutely fine to do that because it provides us the tool to understand and to map the world, right? Like, you know, so we do that and these are tools, but these are not, these means to an ends, they're not an ends in themselves, right? And we must have a bigger political vision of what we see as the end of law and development scholarship, right? And so I think that we should draw on these critical traditions of law and development to counteract this, because we need to problematize the law, we need to problematize the legal processes, we need to problematize development and development policy, um, because there are power dynamics that, that underlie all these things. I mean, David talks about the different challenges of fragmentation, of hegemony, of contextualization, and communication, and this is all, beneath all that, is really power dynamics, right, and power symmetries, right, at the end of it. And, and we need to understand how we can mobilize resistance to this hegemony to engender the sort of change that we want in, econ in the economy, in the uh, political sphere, ecology, etc. And so law and development must be, in my perspective at least, moving forward, a critical praxis, right? We must, as scholars, provide the epistemic tools to confront and challenge the problems of our time. So the inequality, ecological crisis, etc. And this movement, so the movement towards this technocratic solution, and as much as I do appreciate that there is a place for them, they cannot be in isolation of the larger political questions of contestation. Because in, to do so is just really scary, right? And so in that sense, I go back to this con uh, the contextualization, the hegemony, and the southern voice, right? Um, um, and at the presentation this morning on publication and access to knowledge, we talked about this. We talked about how a lot of scholars in the South um, are prevented um, uh, uh, from accessing uh, you know, knowledge, from contributing to the knowledge on law and development, whereas they're at the sharp end of law and development, really, right? Um, I am a child of the South. I'm proud to be one. I grew up in the South, but I spent most of my professional careers away. So I, I, I'm, although I'm, I know and I appreciate that these, sometimes these are theoretical questions for me, and I appreciate that that's my privilege, right? Um, but so we need to understand, right? Because a real partnership is understanding that there are already southern institutions in the uh, institutions in the south that are strong. So we talk about, you know, um, I think David, you, you kind of mentioned that you know we've got to be careful because there's some institutions in the you know we have to build up an, a, a, a stronger institutions in the south. And I appreciate that 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 um, comment. It's it's completely valid. But we also must recognise that actually institutions in the south and scholars in the south are already strong. The reason that they're not you know out there is because the structural symmetries in the epistemic authority, all these are closed off to them. So the access um, is really, really problematic. So there's already a strong tradition of law and development. You mentioned Yashkai in Africa and Latin America and Asia. And what we need to do is to elevate voices from the South. We need to elevate these voices. Um, and, and that means we must not be afraid of contestation. We must not be afraid to cede our privilege. We must not, as scholars from the South, uh, from the, um, uh, well, I'm from the South, so I'm not wearing two hats. Um, but, you know, we, we, those of us who reside in very privileged positions and have access to this, A, must have the conscience and the strength to speak. And then, secondly, to have the humility to understand and to cede our space. Thank you very much. Um, that is some act uh, to follow. Um, firstly, thank you to Philip, um, to Thomas, and to Michael for asking me to be part of the conversation. Thank you to, to David for asking me as well. Um, I have some, I have, I think, quite similar in essence comments, but much less eloquent uh, and much less powerful. Um, let me see if I can expand in a slightly different way. Um, so again, I'm taking this as the conversational format um, that we were asked to do. So the idea of, and I'll start with the context. So the idea of scan globally, reinvent locally. Um, and I've been reflecting on, on that over the last couple of days, um, based also on your, on your article on it. Um, and I've been trying to think it doesn't feel right, and I've been trying to think what, it, what doesn't feel right about it. And I think it's this idea that it has a technocratic feel, this sense that we can solve problems 
right? This, um, by getting a right answer, albeit that it's one that's uh, perhaps in, uh, locally determined. Um, and we can do that by identifying the right comparator, so picking up on, on, um, on Katerina's uh, earlier keynote. And I find that similar, I think, then to Celine's, uh, deeply problematic, in part because it seems to push contestation out. There's still this idea that we can find a solution to a problem. Um, and I wonder whether, whether you accept that critique, and, and if you do, whether you see that it's in some way compensated by your call for greater participation from the global south or overturning hegemony. And, and I, I would like to ask you how you would see um, that working, whether, you know, how you would bring in contestation. And so, um, I share a similar, image, uh, uh, a similar vision of law and development uh, to Celine, this idea of critical praxis, that this idea that it's about trying to provide a field of inquiry where we can talk about different, different methodologies, different framings, where we use law perhaps and as a frame for setting up contestation. Um, in some ways managing perhaps, or, and also including new voices. So using law as a revolutionary tool then to break down um, forms of participation. Um, and then in terms of how we then see our role as scholars, so I don't recognize myself as a scholar from the global north, perhaps most of all on the panel, as someone you know, representing very much the global north and the very privileged position that that gives us, of scan globally, reinvent locally. Rather, I think, I'm still trying to work out what my role is. I certainly don't fully know it. And I think I've had some inspiration from the panels here. So particularly um, a panel that we did yesterday morning looking at German histories of law and development. And I think there's so much work that Northern scholars need to be doing in identifying their own traditions of law and development, of the deeply rooted nature of, of or the way in which these are deeply rooted in colonialism and the way in which that colonialism still continues and how we approach these, these continuing traditions of law and development. Um, and I think that's a role that perhaps We've, we've neglected or many of us have neglected and that's something um, that I want to take forward um, certainly when I go back um, to the Netherlands this weekend. Picking up on the question of fragmentation, I think, I mean, I think, of course, uh, it's, an, you know, it's a very valid diagnosis. I, I think we would all agree with that. But I think it has to be broader than just law and development. So there's a fragment, you know, if we think of, of development studies more broadly, law and development is a very small part. And in fact, uh, at least in the Dutch context, a very insignificant part of, of what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is funding and, and what the, where, the, um, where the development debate is. Um, and at least in the Netherlands, most of the money, and perhaps one could argue rightly, goes to health specialists, water engineers, agricultural engineers. And something that we've started in, um, in the Netherlands is trying to have, um, we come together regularly, uh, project recipients from NVO Votro, which is the Dutch um, uh, financing body. Um, and we come together in dinners and we talk about our agendas and we talk about what we think is important. And then we talk about how we're going to try and change policy from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, how we're going to try and change their funding schemes. Um, based on the different sort of shared agendas that we have. So I wonder whether you see this fragmentation as something uh, much, more, uh, much, much more broad. In terms of hegemony, um, again, the, the, yeah, it, it, yes, of course. Um, but I, so in, in trying to think about how we try to overcome hegemony, I think one of the focuses has to be on building long-term relationships, right? That I think many of our funding structures are designed over three years. Three years is a really long funding window now and that we sort of rush in often with scholars and with money and then we expect to create something lasting out of sort of three years. Um, that we have to be in it for a much longer game and recognize that the ebb and flow. Um, it's going to require perhaps resource transfer, right, in a way that most of our faculties are, are not geared towards um, and maybe one way of trying to do this is to create things like staff exchange, um, to create these longer term uh, relationships. Um, I think it also requires, and I think this has been really lacking, at least in my experience, that again, we tend to rush in with our money and our knowledge and our epistemic traditions without realizing that there's a, you know, often a very vibrant legal tradition, a very vibrant critical legal tradition in, in the countries that we arrive in. And I think, um, of course, the, the, the onus has to be on us um, to learn about those traditions long before we, we design our projects, never mind before we actually arrive. Um, uh, and to do, we have to reflect also, I think, on many of these joint projects, we end up being a burden. So I know that um, I have a partnership where, with the University um, of Rwanda, and I know that even if I go and, I, and I'm paying my way and I, I offer my time for free, of course, and so on, I do become a burden on them. So to what extent am I actually really bringing something? To what extent is simply hosting me a burden on, on the institution that I possibly can't, can't live up to? Um, and in terms of then, finally, 
so I'll, I'll sort of skip communication because I think Celine covered it and I think I'm running out of time. But in terms of the pressing questions for the field, um, for me, the, the most pressing questions then become things like, how can scholars from, from the third world seize the field? And more importantly, do they want to? Right? I mean, is, this, is the field of law and development, putting aside the question of whether we're a field at all, is this something that's, that's, that scholars from the third world actually want? They, that they wish to lay claim to, to reinvent it? Or should we just, in a sense, maybe then, sort of, it's something that we keep talking about in terms of our histories of legal praxis, and for the rest, the other scholars have to really very much create something that they want, rather than, than, than being faced with the burden of taking up something that we sort of say, well, hey, now it's time for you guys to take over this field. You know, maybe, maybe they don't want to. Um, and I will end it there and pass it down. Okay, thank you very much. So next is uh, Johan. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to join this um, panel. <coughs> um, I'll try to keep uh, or add a couple of things to the conversation we're having. I would like to focus on also on the gaps and the pressing issues for the field. Um, and I want to talk about from the perspective of, I don't think I'm representative of the Colombian scholarship at all, but uh, I feel um, our perspective of law and development is different um, in a country like Colombia, in particular given not just the context, but the effects that development has brought about in a context like Latin America. So although I don't think I represent, um, I'm not the voice of uh, the Colombian scholarship, I would like to add from my personal experience working in, in Colombia, but being educated in the global north, but, and also having uh, participated in uh, discussions in, in, in other regions and in other contexts about law and development. So <clears throat> I would like to um, take Celine's point about epistemic, epistemological balance. Uh, we had a conversation uh, yesterday about how development is deeply rooted in particular epistemologies and how this, uh, or this the epistemological silence, and she was borrowing uh, one to the Sosa's um, concept about uh, the silences of uh, projects such as development. And um, I think, sorry. And I think um, it talks about one of the fundamental questions that I think is important to go back to, and is what is what development is. And I think, unlike uh, the, the discussion about the moments of development, it's important to um, reflect on how mainstream ideas of development have changed and how the law has been implicated and related to those main ideas. But I think. And it's not absent because I have heard these <coughs> debates in, in many of the panels I have attended, but I think we have to take them seriously and is to engage with the critical literature about development. So, um, and I think we have to go beyond Amartya Sen and engage with other debates, such as, um, on the first hand, we have to engage with the literature on the colonial legacy and the relationship between development and the civilizing mission. I don't want to say anything about it because other people have already talked about it, but I think it's something that we have to keep in mind when we talk about development. Uh, I think we also, have, and I think it has already been mentioned that uh, and we have to engage with the literature about development as a depoliticizing machine and the relationship between turning development into technical issues and how this precludes democratic deliberation and on economic self-determination. So I think we have to go back uh, to the question on how by trying to impose or adopt technical solutions we can be uh, closing the democratic space for the uh, debates about economic self-determination. And I think in that point I would like to um, connect the debate about uh, the de development as a depoliticizing machine with the current debates about authoritarian neoliberalism. And, and I think we have to be careful uh, about uh, turning development, yeah, and, and I think this has been already said in a lot of spaces, turning development into a top-down, actively an authoritarian project. So um, we have to 
take or talk about development, taking into account other voices and other epistemolo epistemologies. And I think in that regard, it's important to engage with the literature about post-development. I'm talking about when we vivir, the degrowth movement, and recognize that development as improvement, as prosperity, as society flourishing, may have different meanings and can be constructed differently. So development is also about imagination and how we imagine different futures. And I think we have to engage with that conversation. It's really important in order to um, construct or um, open the, um, the law and development debate to other uh, dimensions of social life. So it is not only a matter of context, but it's also a matter of epistemolog epistemologies, and it's also a matter of imagination. And the second point I would like to highlight, and uh, Celine already has said something about it, is that development can also be a very violent project. So it's not only about the epistemological violence. We have been discussing about how development, uh, when it is constructed for a Western perspective, rooted in colonial legacies, um, silences uh, and eradicates other ways of thinking and other knowledges. But uh, development can also be uh, violent in a very material and physical um, way. So for instance, um, in July 2019, Colombia woke up with the news that a criminal gang, which, is call, uh, which called itself the Black Eagles, which is a re-articulation of paramilitary forces, threatened a mem members of a local council under the claim that they are enemies of development. So the members of this council uh, were given 20 so 22 hours to leave the town. Uh, which is located in the north part of uh, Cauca um, in Colombia. The council, which represents African Colombian communities from, from this part of the region, have been opposing the expansion of uh, agro-industrial and mining projects in the area. So this is just one of the examples of that physical balance of development I'm talking about. Uh, I also would like to highlight that many social leaders in, in the country have been murdered precisely because of their opposition to different forms of development projects, uh, ranging from the construction of highways to hydroelectric dams like Irituango, which is the one um, we have some posters in the foyer. So basically, the leaders from uh, the, one of the communities which is opposing Iri Triangle have been displaced, and they were not compensated, and now they are um, bringing like, uh, legal claims uh, before local courts and also before the Inter-American Development Bank uh, for the uh, displacement uh, without compensation that they were uh, subjected to. Um, so what I mean is that Development is violence not only because it silences of other knowledges or other rationalities, but also because it's deeply uh, complicit with uh, processes of displacement, uh, land grabbing, and as I said, like a lot of people in Colombia have been murdered because of uh, their opposition to development projects. Um, so I'm under the impression that we haven't reflected deeply about that relationship between law and development and violence, and how law has been complicit in many of those forms of violence, not only because um, it's instrumental, which is the traditional story we usually hear, hear in debates about law and development, how law is instrumental to particular ends, but also because law can be or liberal law in itself can be very violent to the extent that it carries with it like uh, particular ras uh, rationalities, for instance, on how humans should, should relate to land and territory. And that's precisely one of the discussions that we are having um, in Colombia right now, like how to, instead of talking about property rights, land rights, talk about, for instance, the right to territory uh, and try to move away from liberal law in these regards. And to conclude, and I don't have more time, much time to, to talk about it, but I think we should also start to think about the relationship between law development and peace building. I think transitional justice processes could be a, a good place to start that debate, but we have to be careful because, uh, I mean, going back to experimentation, I was thinking about the ethics of experimentation, so how are we are going to experiment and find solutions in transitional justice context? I think we have to keep in mind all the time that these experiments are about the life of people, so like basically it can, has material effects on how people live and we have to be careful and we'll have to take into consideration ethics and think about other ways of thinking about peace um, which move away from traditional ideas of growth and institutional presence. And thank you very much.
thank you. Oh, yeah. gosh. Um, uh, I'll hold my chin up. Um, so these have been a really amazing set of interventions. Um, and one of the things that's been incredibly striking about this to me is in the best possible way how I've heard all of this before. But, and this is not at all meant to be dismissive. I've just spent the last few years engaging with a few different groups of development, uh, practitioners, academics, um, mainly in the politics and development space, not law and development, but politics and development. And what's kind of amazing is that the conversation we've just had here has been enacted over and over again by those guys, when they're thinking about public administration, they're thinking about healthcare, they're thinking about political economy. And not only that, they're actually trying to do something about it. So here we have our own happy acronym called Scroll. Is that right? Scroll is what we have here? Yes, that's the acronym. Yes. Thank you. You've pronounced it properly, too. <laughs> Thank Scroll. You. The emphasis is on the right part. Yes. Good. They have <laughs> Padilla and Twop and Da Da Da. They have Da 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 and they have <laughs> Dulp. Um, <laughs> And so one of the things that I maybe just want to reflect on a little bit is if all of these conversations are happening, what actually is A, new about what's going on now? And David, I'm not sure I agree with you that it's pragmatism, but I'll come to that. So on what's new? Two, using those you know, different projects as insights, what might be missing slightly from our conversation? I think there might be something that's missing that they actually put on the table explicitly. Um, and then third, leading on from that, so what is specific to law? Those guys are thinking about politics and development. What is specific to law, or are we really just having a generic response to some general unease about development? And I think there might actually be something specific about law. Um, but so what I wanted to do was just think with the structures of these other acronyms, the TWOP and the DULP and the da da da, um, to see how they're similar to scroll and what we've, and the critiques that have been mounted against it, but also a bit of a map to show us what's similar, but then also to use it as a way of pointing out the, the gap um, that I see at least. And I think it, it, structurally what we see is a set of fundamental, three fundamental moves, right? So there's, the first one is problem identification. Oh, we're all freaked out about something. The second is an epistemological response. Oh, how can we know this thing a little bit better? And then the third is the sociological response, which is, oh, we actually need to have some way of organizing how we know this thing better that we're really freaked out about. So the problem, I think, is really common, which is the radical complexity of development today. Um, and all of the projects that I can think of offer some version of American, a very specific American inflected pragmatism in response to it. Um, so it's just worth noting two things about that here. One is that these other projects do so in the idiom of politics, that the politics of development is radically complex, and by politics they mean kind of something like power, conflict, relationships, collaboration, contestation, that sort of thing. Um, for us, we're thinking about law, but those distinctions as yet aren't particularly manifest. The second thing that I just want to note about this kind of, whoa, development's really complex, America, pragmatic response thing, is that all of these projects, even as they push us to think or have an operative map about development uh, as a complex system, um, so what they're doing is that they're pushing us away from an operative map as north, south, center, periphery, and they're saying, no, 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 it's way more complex than that. You just can't have your old static categories of north, donor, south, you know, country, the map is way more complex. At the same time, all of these projects tend to emerge from the north, as this one does. Right? So that's the problem identification bucket. Then the second thing that they do is the epistemological response. And if, in essence, what they say is we can no longer divide theory and action, or theory and practice. That just doesn't work anymore. You can't have ideas, usually in the north, and then apply them, usually in the south, you have to, I don't know, there's a bunch of words that we've heard as well. We have to design, we have to create, we have to iterate, we have to experiment. 
And I think what's important about this, and you see this, I think, in David's story, is that they involve a really blurry and different form of agency. We're no longer thinkers or doers. We are entrepreneurs. We are experimenters. And what this shift in agency does that's really important, that underpins, I think, some of Celine's intervention, is that it, it, I mean, it makes the agency blurry, and it gives us the idea that we can be horizontal. So the epistemic horizontal. The epistemic move is peer learning. It's horizontal networks. It's sitting in a room and, and learning from each other. Right? So the operative map, remember, shifts from north-south to complexity. And that's in the epistemic domain. That's all about learning. And here, then, we can also situate one bucket of responses, which is, you know, what are you talking about? We can't theorize? Of course we can theorize. Don't be silly. You know, even if it's complex, maybe we can do a better job of theorizing. So that's, you know, the first set of moves, first set of critiques. Then the next move, so problem identification, uh, epistemic, uh, epistemological response, and then there's the sociological response. Now, that's a lot stronger for the politics of development, uh, the politics of development people, um, because what they do is they say, yeah, and this epistemological insight, this idea that development is complex, that's as old as the hills. Hirschman has told us that you know, 50 or 60 years ago. We've known for decades that we need to be pragmatic. But what we really need to do today that's different is we need to really organize sociologically, we need to organize how we respond to that complexity. That's what's new today. That's what's really, really different. So this isn't that we're now in a pragmatic moment, David. I think this is that we're trying to organize some ways of diffusing that pragmatism and diffusing knowledge and feedback loops in order for us to creatively iterate and adapt, and so on. Um, so what we've seen in the last couple of days here about this sort of sociological move are a bunch of phrases uh, that go for you know, things like, we need to think about the institutional requirements of institutionalism, as I think Kat Pistor said on Wednesday. Um, or as David said on Wednesday, um, a scholar in Cape Town has a micro world but then kind of by implication here, we're people with a macro world or a macro perspective. All of these are sociological points. Now I wanna be clear that I'm gonna take an anormative tone about that sociological point, but I do also wanna point out that in the language that we've been using, and Celine made this point very strongly, we are trying to establish, when we sociologize the kind of spread of knowledge, we are establishing hierarchies, we are doing boundary work. So Katharina Pistol's idea that we select peer groups through methodology is another way of saying, I'm going to pick who's around the table for my law reform project. Right? So these efforts are all sociological efforts to determine who's in and who's out, who's up and who's down. And then we can see a set of responses, like in particular Morag's and Celine's, but I think across the table, which is a critical move to say, no, 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 your hierarchies aren't the hierarchies that I want. I want my hierarchies to be different. I want them to be a little more horizontal, a little more networked, nicer, empowering, and so on. And there's a really, you know, there's a lot of normative power in that. But that's a story of hierarchy. Now this brings me to the fourth, uh, the fourth move, and this is one that, David, you don't make, and this is the one that I wanna push you on. This is, I think, the really important gap so the epistemic move is networked. It's horizontal. It's saying, hey, we can all learn from each other. The sociological move is hierarchized. Some people are in, some people are out. There's a tension there, right? The epistemic quantum, the South, the South in David's story, as I understand it, has epistemic agency. It knows its own context. But yeah, it's sociological agency, maybe less so, right? The sociological agency is kind of in the North. Katharina Pistor is the one who develops the methodology that says who's in and who's out from your reform process. So how do you resolve that tension? And this is where these other acronyms, the PADIAs and the da da das and others, are super, super effective. And what they say is twofold. Or, or rather, what they do is they say, we have a political project explicitly, and that political project has a political structure. 
So for some of them, what they say, which is pretty powerful, is sure, our sociological organization comes from the north. We're guys at Harvard, the Building State Capability Project. We're guys from Harvard. We recognize we're from the north. But we're going to be so entrepreneurial and savvy that we're going to instrumentalize our power in the north to educate a whole bunch of people in the south using funds that we have raised in ways such that they can be totally entrepreneurial when they're trying to do their reforms down in the south or the, the TWAP people. They say, we are going to train people in the North, particularly donors, to be way more savvy and sophisticated and networked and complex so that they get rid of their hierarchies of you know, log frames and project documents and their funding apparatus has to be way more Southern oriented and way more flexible and adaptive. How can they say that? because they have a really clear story about what their core thing is. Remember, their core thing is politics. That is about some sort of collaboration, power, um, you know, building alliances and destroying other people. That's what politics is about. And as a result, for politics and development, what they're trying to do is they're trying to politicize it all the way up and all the way down. Right? They're trying to say, even the donors have to be understood politically. We've got to study not just over there, the South, as the site of politics. We've got to do political economy analyses of ourselves, and we've got to work out how we can change everybody into entrepreneurs. To put it another way, the political project is to produce for them a particular political subjectivity amongst development people. One minute. OK, so then I'm going to not do the last bit, which is what's law got to do with it, other than to say, they can do that because they have a clear political project, because they have a clear idea about what politics and development means. If we're going to try and organize ourselves to make that balance, that tension between complexity and north-south hierarchies, we can't just say, oh, we'll do it by having nice conferences. We also have to have a really clear idea about what law means, what it is, well, precisely, but the, the, on the one hand, Either you have an account of what law means, or you keep going round and round in circles, having kind of nice conferences and not really working out some balance between your north-south hierarchies and your complex maps of the world. And you, know, you end up doing maybe a nice conference every year. So all I'm saying is we need to perhaps theorize the political project a little bit more. And I'd love to hear more on that from David, which I think has to start with some account of what law is and what it's doing. So thank you very much uh, for this first round. So now we still have some time since we started late and uh, to sort of open up and, and continue the conversation a little bit. You'll st still all get to lunch and, and I'll take questions presently. But Bef before I do so, as just David has, has asked me to respond very briefly to some of the questions that were directly addressed to him and I'll, I can't deny him that chance. And uh, for everyone else, you can already sort of start formulating your concise and short questions, please, that we're going to collect later, first on that side and then on that side, so we'll have microphones there. Um, so please uh, formulate, prepare your questions, and uh, we'll be with you in a moment. But briefly, David, please. So um, I think this is great, and I, I think that um, you've got a lot to chew on, and I'm glad that I inspired all this critique. Um, so, okay. So first I want to say pragmatism is not technocratic. It can be technocratic. Technocrats can be pragmatic. But the, uh, my idea of pragmatism is certainly not technocratic. Uh, when I say uh, we need to find out what works, I just, I mean what works for whom. And so issues of, of distribution, and uh, uh, using that term broadly, are inherent part of the project. Um, it is not simply ignorant. If, if it is, it's dumb. It's not ignorant of hierarchy, of gender dis differences, of racial differences, of all the, the issues that we, we are all sensitive to. Uh, that's just part of the process. Um, so I just want to be sure that you don't equate pragmatism necessarily with kind of blind technocracy. I thought that what Kival just said 
is a wonderful way to think about the project that I'm in favor of, which is to ensure that the South has both epistemic agency and sociological agency. So that's the project. The project is to say, the epistemological project of, of law and development started where the ideas all emanated from the North and they were imposed on, on the South. And that's what we try to do by disrupting the discourse. That's what scholars in self-estrangement was actually supposed to do and, and seem to succeed so much that the agencies stopped funding us, which is something I want to get to. Um, so, so I think that, that that's a project, if I understand it, uh, and that's also you know, a project that you described as horizontal, and I endorse that completely. Um, uh, so then the question is, obviously we have to dis disrupt the developmental discourse, um, but but we also have to ask ourselves how we do that uh, while maintaining our engagement with people in the South who are caught up in that discourse and may have their careers threatened if we, dis if we disrupt it too much. So this is a complicated micro-political question. Um, and how we maintain our connection to the agencies, North and South, um, uh, and to the legal uh, profession and legal institutions uh, of the South. So this is a very delicate game uh, that has to be played horizontally, jointly, because while we want to give epistemic, epistemic agency to the South, I don't think we want to say, okay, we're going home, South, you guys go ahead, we, we, you've got it now, we're just gonna go and, I don't know, play football or whatever. Um, uh, because of the fact that everybody is embedded in a global network. And so actually, people in the North have something to say about the epistemology of the South, just as the people in the South have something to say about the epistemology of the North. And so there really is a room for horizontal networks that are North and South, but equal and and, and committed to a pragmatic effort to understand the distributional effects of development policies and disrupt the discourse if, they, if it supports illegitimate hierarchy. And finally, I wish you had gotten to law. Law is the arena in which a lot of this happens. The important thing to recognize is that the law is where a lot of these, this politics and this epistemology and the, these policies get frozen and that's where you can disrupt them because we live in this world. That's our comparative advantage. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So we'll collect questions from the audience now. Then we'll have one round of responses. Then I hope to connect, collect another like three, four questions, uh, final round of responses, and then we'll all go for lunch. So I'll start on this side. We have a microphone, and um, you can go over there. I'll collect. We'll start in the back, sort of, to... Um, the lady in the back with, yeah, exactly, the arm high up, and then we move our way to the front. I saw that here. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes, we're Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. And if you could briefly just introduce yourself before. Okay, yes, so my name is um, Abele from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, panelists, for the very insightful discussion. Um, I think my, my question is for um, everybody, but maybe specifically Ms. Tan. Um, I was just wondering, you know, in this arena where we are all trying to um, renegotiate or, or reevaluate uh, the application of top-down development approaches and um, sort of reorganize our take on how power asymmetries affect development approaches, um, sort of in order to really, really take an honest 
look at situation because you mentioned specifically that there are very strong institutions in the global south and um, there are perversive generalizations that sort of distort um, uh, development agendas. Uh, on the other hand of that argument, there are sort of pervasive weakness in institutions and even if we want to come away from the top-down development approaches and sort of focus on the power asymmetries and the individual dynamics or the policy dynamics of each uh, southern countries, in uh, each context, are we now going to reorganize or maybe legitimize pervasive political conduct as part of a legitimate way of um, revolutionizing the de de um, development, as it seems, I think. I don't know if you understand. Can you, okay. Sorry, can you repeat that point about the political? Okay, yes, yeah, so basically, while we understand that there are institutions that are weak, um, institutions that are strong, there are also institutions that are weak in the global south, and I, I do understand that I'm making the generalization here, but aside from that, are we, as part of a move towards a new take on law and development, pulling away from top-down development approaches. Should we now um, legitimize perhaps um, on maybe nefarious uh, political um, arrangements or political climates in such a way that um, they become legal or maybe monitored or transparent? I'll give a short example, maybe in the US, uh, something that doesn't seem very, um, very suitable like lobbying and getting Congress to sort of um, push an agenda based on their, contact, uh, their constant contact by special interest groups. Uh, something like that, they know that they cannot really get rid of it, so they sort of legislated up on it and they make it transparent, they make it more reasonable, they make it uh, easy to follow or monitor. So is, is this what we are suggesting in this new wave of uh, you know, movement from top-down development approach? Okay, thank you very much. Now the gentleman here in front behind the laptop, please. Yeah. You're the one, when you. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Agung Wardana from Gajah Mada University of Indonesia. My question is directed to David, actually. Um, thank you for your talk, and you talk about the four, four challenges faced by low development currently. And uh, I would like to ask you, what about a conceptualization problem? Conceptualization problem. Yes, uh, as we know that we still in a debate what we understand by law and its development as well, and how, how we uh, have very different opinion on that. And the second question uh, is that, are we still based our discussion on the, on ideal concept of liberal legality? Or we are actually facing toward, uh, we are facing a move toward neoliberal legality where liberal dichotomies such as public-private has been blurred and incorporation of uh, non-state legal orders to provide a range of choices, especially for economic investors in uh, exercising legal entrepreneurship has been more common in access to justice program in developing countries. Are we still talking about liberal legality or we, we, are, move, we are facing something different than liberal legality, which is neoliberal legality? Uh, where we not talk about the state law, we also talk about uh, non-state legal orders as well in this context. And uh, I would like to have your take on that. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, the, lastly, here in the first row, please. Here in front. Or. Uh, uh, Professor Goodman, Goodwin, I was very intrigued by your last comment. So I, I wonder if you could elaborate. My name is Renu Dueña. I'm from Universidad de Los Andes in Colombia. Uh, so about this idea that, so what's, is there a burden to the label of law and development? Could there be a burden to the label of law and development that people wouldn't want to 
carry, let's say. There's a burden of, of devolve. was mentioning pragmatism in a way, this idea, this problem solving mode that necessarily requires interaction with funders, this the sociology of organizing around a loan development projects requires money and that requires hierarchies necessarily, it requires a discourse of politics. Uh, so could you elaborate on that? I, I found that extremely powerful. Okay, thank you. So I sense reactions on the panel. Maybe we'll start uh, in reverse order. Do you want to go ahead and then we'll hear from the discussants first? Okay. Do you all want David to respond? Okay, so <laughs> the privilege of the skin. Do you want to respond to that question? <laughs> Do you want to respond? <laughs> uh, sure. Um. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> well, uh, well, well, okay, so the first, the first is the one about contextualization, or conceptualization, I'm sorry. So uh, I guess the question, uh, let me be sure I understood the question uh, first. So if we're going back to scholars and self-estrangement, there's a critique of what we call liberal legalism. Uh, and, and we said that that was, that was the sort of dominant idea in the development discourse of its time. We tried to disrupt that discourse, uh, which we didn't very much succeed, but that was our effort uh, uh, to say, you know, there are, there are other alternatives, there are other models, there are, uh, uh, we, we have to be sensitive to, uh, to the variety of legal orders. Uh, and I think we're still, where, that's where we are today in terms of, I think, where the scholarship is, where, where the world is. Uh, I think we've been going through a whole series of, of movements, and I have not followed the development agencies. There are people on this panel who, who are much closer to that world than I am today, um, but I don't think that the agencies have, have, uh, uh, have given up on that, those ideas. And now we're facing authoritarian efforts to disrupt what liberal institutions have been created, which is causing us sort of people to step back and say, well, wait a minute, maybe there isn't, let liberalism ain't so bad after all, let's, let's be careful we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think the conceptualization issue is still with us, it hasn't changed very much, but we're in a new world where authoritarian governments are using the law to legitimate non-anti-democratic authoritarian things, and, and they're colonizing liberal institutions to that effect. And that's now, I think, one of the important issues that we have to take on because it affects everything in countries, whether it's here or in New York or, or Sao Paulo. Uh, okay, the, the law and development is the label a burden. Well, it has been. And, there, and, and I think scholars and self-estrangement helped that. It sort of gave it a bad name. Uh, in fact, law and modernization, which was the first term, and that was the name of our program, uh, Brunato Bridi told me that uh, the, the uh, um, what is now called the world, world law. World Comparative Law. World Comparative Law Journal, which he edited, uh, was one of the editors for many times for a short period after he left Yale and went back to uh, Germany and, and they used the term law and modernization as a subtitle of the, of the, of, of the uh, uh, journal and then after three or four years of reading the critiques, they decided that was a bad idea and they dropped it. So it, it, law and development has had a bad name because it was associated with the conventional top-down a neo-imperial kind of, uh, you know, northern imposition, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, but it seems that it's working again. Maybe it's lost that connotation. I don't know. I mean, I, call it Chinese checkers. I don't care what you call it as long as you do it. But we've got this title and we've got this institution and it seems to be working and that's pragmatism. And I think distributional analysis will show that people in the Global South are benefiting from this. So go with it. Distributional analysis. Okay, so please, uh, reactions from the panelists. Um, Deva, Rana, Morag, Celine. Thanks. Um, so I think the questions are incredibly... Is this, uh, is this on? Yep. yep. I found the questions really helpful, um, in particular to pin down what is legal about the story that we're telling, which still strikes me as being important, um, and not just for the fun 
joy of trying to define a noun, but really for the social project that we're engaged in. So, you know, David, as you know, all sociological projects are hierarchized. I mean, as much as we might want to say that we want to have everything be nice and flat and horizontal, there are always going to be, as, as you also point out, hierarchies, whether it's because of the, peop you know, the ability to mobilize funding in the north or whatever it might be. But it, what I think is interesting when looking at these other projects, these other acronyms, the PUDIAs and the TWAPs, um, is that they uh, expressly articulate as a political project a thing to be universalized that allows them to make the um, social hierarchy more horizontal. So in their story, they take a very individualistic view of the political entrepreneur. That's who they want everyone to be, a savvy political entrepreneur who can go around and pragmatically work things out and make things happen. And what's useful about that is that for them, it allows them to make everything horizontal. As long as everyone in the North and the South is that political entrepreneur, then we can kind of do away with hierarchies. But also, it allows that vision to be critiqued as well. So you can really have a back and forth with them about how plausible it is to eliminate these hierarchies. So what view of law do we have that allows us to imagine or fantasize that we can eliminate these hierarchies and then critique that? And I heard the beginnings of one from you, David, which I think is really important to put on the table and maybe push against. And there's something both collective and redemptive in law. There's, it's a collective project that maybe allows us to provide a format for collective discussion and debate through which we can redeem some of the issues that it really, really bug us. And all I want to put on the table is the risk of being the useful idiot when you do that. Uh, the useful idiot. And I say that not to cast a slur, but because I have been that useful idiot over and over again. And there's something really important in the collective nature of law rather than the individual nature of the political entrepreneur that makes that happen, which is, you know, I can tell a whole story, but just to put very simply, when donors give you money to go and do a law project that is totally about elevating local voices and building South-South networks and flattening hierarchies and so on, so I've done this from within development agencies as well, you, get, you go off and do that for many, many years and try your best to build a wonderful multi-stakeholder whatever process. And at the same time, in the background, not only does development carry on unchall uh, unchallenged, but what development actors do, so agricultural economists, in my experience, will say, I recognize that my project has a real political problem. That political problem is an institutional one. How do we essentially sort out collective action so that people don't get really annoyed about the way in which my agricultural reforms are going to mess up land? Here, you lawyer, please go and do something with that, with this $4 million. Now, whether or not you actually do something with it doesn't matter at all. As long as you take that political problem in legal form and do it over there, I can then go on and continue with my fundamental transformation of the agriculture and privatization of the agricultural system. So I really do want to put on the table, what is law? How do we imagine it to be um, uh, politically horizontal? And then what are the risks involved in doing so? Thanks, Joanna. Right, thank you. Um, I was thinking that um, I feel that the problem of fragmentation is not very difficult to be solved uh, within this context. I, I mean, you were talking about um, trying to identify our common political project, and I think that's very difficult for what we have been talking about. So I don't think, I think fragmentation is going to be with us, and I think it's worth to keep the label and keep talking about law and development because, in a way, this is a space uh, or the law development label is creating this space in which we can talk about different political projects and we can talk and imagine other forms of law uh, away from liberal law or neoliberal law. So I think in that sense, it's worth keeping the label, it's worth keeping these conversations, and although, although it's difficult to think about a single political project, I think we share uh, many concerns about improvement, uh, about how to make people's lives better, about better institutions, and keep, keep having this conversation and include law and think about other forms of law. I agree, I think there is a move towards neoliberal legality, we can see that a lot of development projects in the field are about you know, microfinances linked to create entrepreneurial women, for instance. And so we have to start to, to think about law, not just at the institutional, uh, central, national levels, but also how law uh, plays in the field and helps to constitute particular subjectivities such as entrepreneurial women. So, Marek, please. 
Great. Um, so thank you for the question. So I'm afraid it wasn't a necessarily a particularly clever critique. What I was thinking of was, I mean, of course, the way in which the term development itself is loaded um, and, and sort of the way in which um, Twailers have, cri have critiqued international law, right, very, very deeply as so the critique goes all the way down and, and leaving the open question, I mean, can international law, you know, is there something worth redeeming? I mean, in one sense, that's uh, that's a, you know, a, a very theoretical question because international law continues, and, and it and but it's worth, I think, a critique worth continually making. And I think um, when many of us in the north talk about law and development as a field, and we say, where should, you know, what is the future of law and development? There is somehow an expectation that while the answer to that is we sort of hand this project that was ours to scholars in the global south and say, go on, now it's yours. Right? And, I, and I, what I wanted to say was, wow, you know, that, that's a, yeah, maybe they don't want it and maybe there's a good reason and maybe they have their own project. And so we shouldn't assume that that's, I think, a path to, to say, the future uh, of, of law and development. That was simply what I was trying to say. And it may well be that they say, you know, keep your project, quite frankly, and, and keep working on it yourselves. So, um, and that's what I was trying to say about this historical um, delayering. Um, Oh, very quickly on the on the on the neoliberal uh, legality. That was a wonderful question. Um, and what I just want to say very briefly is that one of the things that really frightens me now um, is the collection of um, humanitarian data or the way in which data is being collected in development. And so um, um, one of the things that we now see, of course, in the, in the, um, with the with the way Google and Facebook and Palantir and all these organisations are moving into the development space and are hoovering up data for humanitarian uh, purposes, is that individuals are no longer sort of even seen as citizens anymore. Like, they are firstly consumers, they're now workers in the AI economy, and the idea of citizenship, of the way in which law might then, they might have that legal relationship with the state has just disappeared entirely for whole groups of people. Um, and, you know, so I think, you know, this, this neoliberal um, legality is, is still has a way to run. Um, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to be very brief because I'm probably the person standing between you and lunch, right? Um, uh, <laughs> Just on the question by uh, the colleague from Hong Kong, I think I, I quite didn't quite understand it, but I think what you're saying is that we, the weaknesses in southern institutions, how you know, we have to recognise that there are weaknesses and what do you do about it, and there's an endemic within them, as there are in northern institutions as well, but a lot of political corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and, and, and moving away from the top-down. Um, uh, to, to move away from the top-down, we need to acknowledge uh, the you know, the problems that exist within these institutions and perhaps, you know, try and support them. And I think it's a complex issue. And I think this is not, a, this is why I think law and development is, is such inherently a very complex situation. I mean, I, as a, as a person from the South, I mean, of course I'm critical of my own government, right? I'm critical of the state. I'm critical of things and how things are done. But I would like us to find the solutions within, you know, um, uh, 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 the country rather than have it imposed. I think that's the difference. There's, there's almost like a pincer uh, uh, issue about, you know, yes, we probably need external intervention sometimes when we're under attack, when human rights are under attack, you know, from an autocratic state or whatever. Um, but ultimately, the solutions and the resistance have to come from within, right? Um, and, uh, and, and I will say this very proudly. I, I am proud to be a person from the South. I'm proud to be from where I am, um, despite the problematic institutions. And I think one of the things that we need to do is support institutions from the South. And a genuine partnership means actually listening. It's having that agency that Deval talks about. It's recognizing that, you know, in our language, in the way that we present our, our, ourselves in these spaces, who is represented, look around, who's speaking. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm taking up space from somebody who's probably more genuine and, and has more to say about what it's like to do law and development in the South. So I think we need to acknowledge that, yes, but what, what, what we recognize that weakness, I think one of the things that we can do as a community is actually to provide, to empower scholars from the South. Institutions aside, it doesn't matter. But if scholars understand their worth from the South and understand that we have a voice, that we have um, the ability to speak and that we can challenge, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, um, but we can do it. And despite the fact that they can call us things like, you know, you're emotional, you're ideological, you're difficult, you're hysterical, 
We're not, right? We're actually stating the facts. This is the very real problems that are being faced by institutions and people in the South, and development is a much more complex issue uh, than that. So, um, and I think with the thing, I just want to respond very quickly on this issue about liberal institutions and how they're under attack and authoritarian state. I think we're all deeply complicit in that, right? I think that a lot of people don't realize that, you know, these things were coming and because they've been incremental, right? And also because it doesn't affect those people who are sitting in the elite institutions. Because I can tell you that if you were a black and ethnic minority person in the North, you would have had the violent reactions. These are not liberal institutions either in the States. And I think those things, I think not recognizing that there is that privilege, there's a racial, there's a class, right? And there's a geographical privilege blinds us to the things that, that, that are happening and we don't see it and suddenly we say, oh my goodness, you know, this has happened to us. But actually, if you listen to the people on the ground, the people are facing these kinds of asymmetries every single day, maybe you realize those things, these, has, these things were coming. We just were blinded and we, weren't, we didn't see it because we weren't listening. Thank you. Okay, since I promised uh, a last round of questions and a last round of uh, responses um, from the panel. So we'll have th the lady in the front, then we have a gentleman in the back and another gentleman here in the back. Sorry, we don't have time for all the questions. You have to approach the panelists afterwards, but there will be time for lunch. Uh, to do that over lunch, if we take too many questions, there won't be time for lunch. So three brief questions, please, and then a last round of answers. Okay, great. Thank you very much. It was incredible hearing all the views that you had. Um, in my opinion, I wanted to discuss what you spoke about, Mr. David Trubeck, on the issue of the law, the law being the, the main concern within hegemony, right? Because I come from Nairobi. My name is Leila Latif. I'm from the University of Nairobi and also from Cardiff University, where I'm undertaking my PhD. So um, the law in its itself is a challenge when it comes to discourse between sub-Saharan Africa and the Western Hemisphere. And we decided to speak about the issue of how we can challenge the narrative on hegemony, right? Um, what structures have been put in place at the global architectural level that enables scholars from the global south to be able to come in and start challenging this narrative. Um, the OECD currently is leading discussions on digital transformation, fintech, big data, illicit financial flows. Um, they're the ones who are drafting the model on double taxation agreements, right, with which they intend to provide FDI to sub-Saharan African countries. We don't have the capacity, we don't have room to negotiate with the Western Hemisphere on how to um, tune in the DTA so that we are able to tap in the tax resources within our economies instead of letting the taxes that are raised from our economies to fly back to the Western Hemisphere. We don't have that capacity, we don't have that negotiating power, so the law here within the international treaties framework is creating that hegemony. Financial power becomes that hegemony. How do we challenge it? Celine, you talked about we need to have this shared responsibility on how we can combat these narratives. Now, how do we challenge the whole institution of this financial power, whereas we can then come you know, on a sort of a I don't know, a fair table to be able to negotiate on these terms, because it is affecting the law development approach in our countries as well. Uh, it might even be predictable, but uh, like there's immense amount of uh, post-colonial scholarship, and I find that there is amnesia in the uh, legal in legal scholarship in general, but of course in law and development as well, in particular, to not really explore that uh, wealth of literature from post-colonial scholarship and coming from scholars from the South. Um, I'm, I'm Pratyush from East, University of Eastern Piedmont. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is... Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I must say, uh, Professor Trubeck, I really like uh, the way you, you made your presentation, especially your 
candid presentation about the relationship, the epistemological relationship between South and North, which has been addressed repeatedly by the different uh, presenters or panelists as well. But the question that kept in running in my mind throughout was, who is this Southern scholar that we have in mind? What is Southern epistemology? I think there is this underlying understanding throughout the presentation that the Southern scholar is this guy who started studying in the South, went to the West to do a PhD or master's, tidy up his English or French, meet, uh, come to know about international journals, in the process meet some editors probably, and have his publication or her, pu her publication appear in these journals or, or, or publishers. So what happens to that Southern scholar? I think in my experience, there are at least three options. One is, okay, you come to the West, study, get a job in the West, become a Southern scholar working in the West. Second option, you go back to the South with a Western degree and continue doing research with a Western lens, the lens that we adopted from our Western education. Or thirdly, I say possibility of hanging around in the West, getting opportunities to work in international organizations, UN, World Bank, IMF, go back to the South, leading projects, including legal reform and so on and so forth. So I had this third chance, for example, right? I studied in the West, went to uh, a UN agency, leading a legal reform project in Sierra Leone. The, the, the project was adopted with this modernization theory in mind that we need to change all dispute resolution mechanisms relating to land disputes in Sierra Leone into formal institutions. Sitting with a chief from Kono State, I learned a big deal about how institutions may deliver justice but not peace. So my question is this, who is what Southern epistemology? To my mind, what is completely missing is this informal knowledge repository in the South that needs to be explored not just by Southern scholars, but also Northern scholars. We have a common frontier to explore in that context, and this applies pretty much to any field of study as well as law and development studies. And that's uh, something that I wanted for you to reflect on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So I'm sorry we cannot take more questions. Feel free to ask them to the panelists afterwards. Otherwise, we're going to have lunch. So with that, we conclude with the last round of the responses. David will have the last word. And I'll ask you, Celine, to... Uh, I, I, I don't really have... I mean, I can talk to Laila about the financial challenge. I do think that it, it, it is um, a, a, a problem. And I think we need to talk about the structural symmetries much more. Um, and I think the, the funding of institutions uh, in the South is, is a huge problem. The, the question about the Global South Scholar, I think it's all of what you said. Everyone, me, you, um, everybody here. I don't, uh, I don't want to uh, gen generalize because you know Southern scholars are, are, are big, but there is definitely a structural divide between the South and the North, and we can't deny that. I'm, I'm going to pass. Okay. Do you want to respond to anything? I will tell you something. Um, I just want to link something that Morag said very quickly to the strand of themes around what it means to be a scholar of the South and produce knowledge from the South. And one thing that's been really striking in my encounters with all of these pragmatic projects is that they rely on a massive expansion of what they call data gathering. Right? So pragmatic projects require huge amounts of data to facilitate their feedback loops, which in turn at both the qualitative and quantitative level, totally anecdotally from my own eyes, seem to have industrialized the production of data, not just massive algorithmic data gathering apparatuses, but massive sociological data gathering apparatuses where there's a market for people like us to go and produce a huge amount of data that feeds into the sort of pragmatic processes that David's talking about. And I question what sort of legalities are produced, not by the outcomes of the pragmatic process, but the process of generating the feedback loop and pulling in lawyers to be, you know, data producers, so just that. Okay, and last but not least, David, please. So there's a very famous article by Teresa de Laretis, who's a well-known feminist scholar, in which she, this is an old article, in which she advises feminist scholars to live in the contradiction, to understand that they have a vision of equality and justice, but they live in a world of inequality and patriarchy. And in order to deal with that, they must 
bear in mind this contradiction. Uh, it seems to me that if I would, were walking away from listening to this panel, the only way I could resolve the contradictions within the panel is to recognize, and within the subject matter, that you have to live in the contradiction, and, and that law and development is a process of living between a vision of equality and justice and possibilities for achieving that and the recognition of hierarchy and injustice, whether it's a north-south hierarchy, internal hierarchy, gender hierarchy, all the hierarchies that we know, that we live in, the, in, in, in the, with our vision of equality and justice, our recognition of hierarchy and injustice, we struggle in an arena in which these issues can be fought out. Uh, some arenas and some parts of the world are more transparent and flexible, others more frightening, and you go to jail if you, uh, if you, <laughs> if, if you push things too far. Uh, but we all live in that contradiction and we try to maintain the complexity of the multi-dimensions of the field because the law itself is a multi-dimensional enterprise. I think if we could learn that and take that away from here, we will have built something really powerful. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thanks to David. Thanks to our discussants. Thanks to you, everyone. Um, with that, uh, we almost conclude, but Philip Dunn has some last logistical announcements. Thank you. Is this, is this on? Okay. I know you all want to rush off for lunch, and I don't hold you back for long. I just want to say three things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for coming uh, and making this a really wonderful uh, experience. We knew it's going to be big uh, in terms of quantity, but uh, what I at least didn't really expect is the immense energy and the quality and the potential uh, of what we have sort of uh, uh, conducted over the co last couple of days. So I'm really thankful for all of you uh, to come to Berlin. So the second uh, thing is uh, that I want to say is work continues. Uh, so uh, I wanted to alert you to uh, the two events that's coming, that are coming up next year in the Law and Development Research Network. There is the PhD school, which will um, uh, uh, take place in, uh, in, in Rotterdam in the summer, um, and probably also in other uh, uh, places. You should follow our webpage. And there is, of course, the next annual conference around the same time of the year, late September uh, 2000. 2020 in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. So uh, the block your calendars and uh, uh, be there. And now the final and the third point is to uh, thank all of the uh, people in the organizational team. I think it's a... Uh, <laughs> This conference would not have been possible without uh, the many, many uh, people who helped. Uh, first of all, I want to mention the whole, the large team of student assistants who came in from the lawn development class, from my chair, and uh, sat in your uh, conference room. So that's really great. That was basically the, the backbone of the whole organization. Thanks a lot for, uh, for your engagement. <laughs> And then I want to thank Michael for moderating today, Tanja Herklotz for moderating yesterday, Sidat for helping us in, the, in all the selections. So this is the, the larger uh, chair team. And I want to end with two people who are even more than the backbone uh, of the organization. One is Corinna Rudani. I don't know. Uh, now she has left. I actually wanted to bring her up on stage because she, you probably have been in touch with her all the time already. She's organizing the whole financial side, uh, Corinna. So this was really uh, a wonderful um, uh, support on that side and work. And I want to end with Thomas Dolmeyer, uh, who... Yeah, that doesn't need more words. Thanks a lot, and see you all in Port Elizabeth next year. Thanks. Okay.